The finely woven tapestry of life is undoubtedly one of the greatest marvels of our universe. We must urgently reverse the exploitation of the natural world if it is to sustain us for generations to come. The time is long overdue to put nature at the center of our economic model. We must remove our reliance on finite and destructive fossil fuels as our demand for electricity increases. Three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions result from the burning of fossil fuels for energy. Renewables are the only way forward. Global energy consumption is set to increase by 50% by 2050. Some estimates suggest that 10 to 20% of global electricity demand could be met by wave power. EcoWave Power, based in Tel Aviv, have developed a simple, clean, low-cost and scalable technology that may form part of the solution to the growing energy demand. My name is Ina Braverman and I'm the founder and CEO of EcoWave Power. EcoWave Power is an innovative company that developed a groundbreaking technology for generation of clean electricity from ocean and sea waves. I was born in Ukraine. Two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded. I was one of the babies that suffered from the negative effects of the explosion. I actually had a respiratory arrest, I stopped breathing and a clinical death. So given a second chance in life, you definitely grow up with a feeling like I have a purpose. And I truly believe that wave energy is a good reason, especially when my first kind of chance in life uh, was taken away by not so safe way of producing electricity. Wave power is just in its initial steps of commercialization. It's kind of the new kid in the block of renewables. It's a very huge source. According to the World Energy Council, wave energy can produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. When the wave heights reach 50 centimeters, the system commences operation. The floaters are going up and down and they're creating pressure in the system. That pressure is used to turn the hydromotor and the generator. We don't go into the offshore, we install on existing man-made structures. The environmentalists are supporting us because we're taking these bulky huge cement structures which are not so good for the environment and we turn them into a source of clean electricity. My name is Yair Rudik and I'm the Business Development Manager at EcoWave Power. As a new source of renewable energy, most of our challenges lie in creating policies and a legal framework for adopting wave energy in new markets. If we were to implement this worldwide without any obstructions, I foresee gigawatts of wave power being installed within the next decade. I don't think we have the luxury of waiting around anymore, and really now is the time to go ahead and make a change. Here we can see the illustration of the project that we're currently building in the port of Jaffa in Israel. I personally love the fact that uh, we're building this innovative uh, project in the most ancient port in the world, the Jaffa port. There are many, many unused breakwaters all over the world. They're not prime real estate, they're just there. So there's no reason for us not to transform them into a clean energy source. My ambition is to see EcoWave Power's technology implemented in any location in the world that has a breakwater. Change is definitely not happening fast enough. I think that Mother Nature is kind of urgently calling us to wake up with all the floods and fires and natural disasters that we're currently seeing. In the end of the day, we all want a 100% environmentally friendly world. So the solution is in all renewable energy sources. I'm very excited about the future of EcoWave Power because I believe that EcoWave Power is a significant part of the world's future renewable energy mix. EcoWave Power is my personal passion. And I always say that passion is the greatest renewable energy source. So my ambition is to really see how wave energy is changing the world.
Rotem, okay, it's working. Thank you so much for um, listening. We are super, super, super proud to introduce Ina Braverman, co-founder of Echowave Power, who is joining us from Israel. Please welcome her. Thank you. But, one minute, Ina. Before you talk, we want to uh, uh, invite to the stage our panelists who are going to be uh, joining you um, to give us the local perspective about clean en energy in Nigeria and the way forward. We invite Mr. Sele Inegbedion, <laughs> the hub manager at All Own, a clean energy hub established by Shell. He has overall responsibility for developing and implementing all owns non-financial support framework for early stage off-grid energy businesses and managing partnerships that enable these businesses to deliver affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy solutions to Nigeria's unserved communities. Please welcome Sele. <laughs> Ifeoma Malo is the campaign director for Nigeria at Power for All, a global decentralized renewable campaign organization. And she is also the founder and CEO of Clean Tech Hub and the Energy Innovation Center in Abuja. She was the immediate past senior policy advisor on energy policies, regulations, and partnerships to the Honorable Minister of Power in Nigeria and uh, advised on the policy direction for large-scale grid-connected and off-grid power. Yes. Ife, are you here? Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. To moderate this panel, we have Dr. Natalie Benish, co-founder at Circular Economy Innovation Partnership, which promotes circular economy businesses innovation and investment in Nigeria through research, advocacy, and program facilitation. SAPE works in close partnership with individuals and organizations who share the goal of building a cater of local entrepreneurs that have both the cap capabilities and opportunities to develop successful circular economy ventures. Please welcome my dear friend, Natalie. <laughs> yes. So before we actually start the panel, we uh, want to hear from Ina a little bit more about her amazing, inspiring um, venture. So, yes, Ina. Hi. Uh, so, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'll share a short presentation in my five minutes. Can you see my screen? Yeah, right? So, basically, I uh, just wanted to explain a little bit about uh, wave energy. So uh, the advantages of wave energy are very clear. Most of the population in the world is living on the coastline. So with this type of population distribution, the need for wave energy is undeniable. Uh, it's a very stable source of electricity. In suitable location, it can generate energy 24-7. Uh, Nigeria, for example, has 853 kilometers of coastline, and it's very open to the activity of the waves, uh, which can produce significant energy amounts. The kinetic energy of uh, the water is 830 times uh, denser than the kinetic energy of air or wind, which means we can provide much larger electricity amounts with much smaller and thus cheaper devices. And the largest thing or the biggest thing about wave energy is that it can actually produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. So if wave energy is so great, why don't we see it everywhere? Why didn't wave energy commercialize? And the answer kind of lies in the photo before you. This technology is not EcoWave Power's technology. This is a company that existed in the past called Pelamis. And 99% of our competitors did exactly what Pelamis did. They decided to install in the offshore, four or five kilometers into the sea. This made their technology super expensive, more than hundreds hundred of millions of dollars for a very small power station. Uh, it broke down after three days of operation because, unfortunately, no man-made stationary equipment can survive the loads of being hit by a 20 meters wave height. Insurance companies saw that these kind of technologies, they break down all the time, they're super expensive, they didn't want to insure wave energy, and environmentalists, which were supposed to be the greatest 
supporters and proponents of wave energy were actually objecting it because it created a new presence on the ocean floor which disturbed the marine environment. So what we can see on the screen right now, this is EcoWave power. We decided on a much simpler but smart approach. Simple hardware, smart software. The only thing in the water is the floaters and the floaters belong in the water and all the expensive ingredients of the technology such as the generators, the hydraulic conversion mechanism, the automation are on land just like a regular power station. So how does our technology work? Uh, we connect to existent man-made structures such as piers, breakwaters, jetties and other types of structures. The floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves. They're pushing the hydro cylinder which transmits biodegradable fluid into land located accumulators. A pressure is being built, the higher the wave, the higher the pressure, which is used to turn the hydro motor, turning a generator and sending clean electricity to the grid via an inverter. The advantages of the technology is that it's 100% environmentally friendly. We do not connect to the ocean floor. We only connect to existent man-made structures. We're also cost efficient. The technology before you is our 100 kilowatt installed capacity in Gibraltar, uh, and it costs only $450,000, which is a big breakthrough for the wave energy sector where Pelamis costs in excess of $100 million in development costs. We're reliable, as we can see in the video below, when the waves are too high for the system to handle, the floaters automatically rise above the water level and they stay in the upward position until the storm passes. When the storm passes, they go back into the water and commence operation, similar to wind turbine. When the wind blows too strong, the turbine actually stops turning and locks down. And we're fully insurable. Because of, the high because of the low price and the high reliability, we're able to get full insurance for our technology. So we started development in the wave pool in the Hydromechanical Institute in Kiev, uh, continued to an off-grid installation in Israel that operated between 2014 to 2020. In 2016, we built our first grid-connected power station, which is operational ever since in Gibraltar. And currently, we're in construction of our second grid-connected power station here in Israel in collaboration and co-investment from the Israeli Energy Ministry, which recognized our technology as pioneering technology, and with partnership with EDF Renewables IL, a subsidiary of uh, Electricité de France, the French National Electrical Company. So here we can actually see the inside of the new power station during testing, a uh, representative from EcoWave Power, from EDF and from Siemens who are providing us everything from the generator to the inverter to the grid connection of the power station. Here we can see the grid connection works. We see that it's much simpler and easier than what has been done or attempted to be done by offshore technologies. All the land is done from the all the work is done from the land side, only 170 meters of grid connections, no ships, no divers, no underwater mooring or cables. So currently we have our technology operational in Gibraltar. We're finishing the construction of our second grid connected power station with EDF. And we signed during COVID at the first 20 megawatt concession agreement, which is the largest project that will be built in wave energy to date, and already received the licenses from DGEG for the first one megawatt for uh, installation and uh, connection to the grid. And uh, the reason for submitting for the first one megawatt is the fact that uh, it's a shorter li licensing uh, timeline. So currently the company holds 325.7 megawatt of projects in its pipeline, including Europe, Asia, Oceania, South America, and other countries as well. So why EcoWave Power is a winning combination? First of all, we have a substantial project pipeline of 325.7 megawatts. We have significant operational experience in real conditions. Uh, our Gibraltar power station is operational since 2016 and we're in construction of our second power station with EDF. We have a significant support from the research community. IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, determined in its recent report that point absorber, which is the type of our technology, is the type of technology that will dominate the market. And we have strong strategic partnerships with companies such as EDF, a Renewables IL, a subsidiary of the French National Electrical Company, and Meridian Energy, which is uh, the biggest uh, renewable energy generator in Australia and Asia. So the company is also recognized by the United Nations. We won the Global Climate Action Award. Uh, we also recognized by Dr. Bernard Picard as part of his Solar Impulse uh, Efficient Solution Guide. Uh, we're also recognized by the C40 Cities Organization and by the Sustainable Markets Initiative of Prince Charles and the World Economic Forum. And uh, maybe I'll finish just uh, a little bit. Uh, some of you saw in the video uh, about my personal story. Uh, I have very high level of passion towards uh, wave energy. 
course, because of my personal experience, I live in Israel, but I wasn't born here. I was born in Ukraine. Two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, causing the largest in history nuclear disaster. I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of the explosion. I actually got a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. Uh, luckily, my mother, a nurse, approached my crib on time and she looked down at me and she saw me pale and blue and not breathing. And she gave me a mouth to mouth resuscitation until the ambulance came and basically saved my life. So I got a ch second chance in life and I really, really want to do something good with it. And I really believe that wave energy that can produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now is a great cause. Thank you. Oh, it works. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. This was, um, I had a chance even before this panel to watch not just the video that was shown, but a, but a few of your other presentations, and they're uh, all um, incredibly uh, inspirational. Um, maybe I will just launch the first question at, at you, Ina. Um, I think what something is really interesting, you know, you're talking about a technology that's, that, that, you know, you can deliver at, at, at different kinds of scale. And you also discussed um, in your presentation a, a number of, uh, like you've, you've entered a number of different markets uh, as well. And you've, in, you've also outlined some of the different kinds of organizations you work through to, to make that happen. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on the kind of coordination that you have, have needed to, to really make a, a project successful. Which, which kind of organizations need to be at the table when you enter a new market? Um, and, and how do they support you? So I think kind of uh, in order to execute the project, we need a triangle of things. So first of all, we need, of course, the space for the project uh, because we connect to existent marine structures such as piers and breakwaters and jetties. Uh, most of the time, uh, the partner that is providing us kind of the ocean space or the land space that is needed is the port or the municipality. So we definitely need the support of the coastal city or, or uh, a certain port within the city that owns the breakwater. Uh, a second thing that uh, is very important to us is the connection to the local electrical company or the energy ministry because this is usually the organization that uh, makes the policies and enables for us to connect to the grid and sets the price for selling the electricity to the grid so basically the feeding tariff and of course the third type of organization that we need is usually either a financial partner or a strategic partner to help us because we cannot of course operate on our own in each and every country so basically we need the financial aspect, we need the aspect from the government, from the energy mi ministry, and we need of course the space to construct. Um, and I'm, I'm also just curious, maybe a follow-up question is, um, is, is all the projects that you're currently running, they're connected to existing grids, they're, they're, uh, they're not involved in the development of new grids? No, so basically the whole uh, concept is to save uh, on the expenses to be able to provide large amounts of renewable energy as soon as possible. This is what we heard all the world leaders, uh, including uh, Nigeria's uh, leaders, saying at COP26. So if we want to implement as many renewable energy solutions as fast as possible, then it's much more, you know, it's much faster and more cost efficient, at least in most of the countries, to uh, connect to the existent power grids, to the existent uh, national electrical grids, rather than creating a whole new one. Interesting. I have two uh, super duper experts on, uh, I guess, alternative energies uh, and, and uh, especially off-grid solutions, which is quite key uh, and important in the Nigerian market. I maybe will first turn to both of you for your reactions in terms of the potential for this kind of solution uh, in, in, in the Nigerian market. Thank you. Uh, Ina, thank you for your um, presentation. And that, that was a very powerful um, presentation and your, your, you know, your, your personal experience. Um, Mike, I had a question, really, which was um, Natalie, your last question about off-grid solutions. So obviously, you're leveraging existing um, national grid infrastructure. If you take Nigeria, for instance, where um, the national grid serves just a fraction of our population, and in part that's due to the, the lay of the land. Um, Off-grid energy solutions, um, you know, we're going to rely on that heavily. Is there a world where your technology, um, wave energy, could be adapted to support these sort of communities and, and regions? 
Definitely. So in that regard, we're not different than solar and wind. Uh, many communities uh, in Africa and in other locations are, are using uh, solar panels to power their local needs, uh, which connect directly to the homes or connect directly to certain communities. Same goes for uh, wind turbines. Same can same can happen with wave energy. Uh, we can basically, if we're talking not about a huge scale project, uh, but like more a kind of com community project, then of course uh, the grid connection co or the connection of that community to that project, so not connecting to the grid, but actually creating kind of a microgrid will be m minimized. Um, so it's definitely possible we can uh, transfer the energy generated by the power of the waves to electrical accumulators, accumulate the energy and then transfer it directly to the houses of the people. So yeah, it's definitely a possibility. So, you know, thank you also. Let me just lean on um, Celeste's question. Uh, thank you also for that presentation. I have a question for you as well, but I also mm -hmm. wanted to make a comment because looking at the technology that you're using and seeing that it's looking at oceans and seas, uh, we have mm -hmm. a lot of that in Nigeria, but I don't know how much breakwater, I'm not sure if you know, Celeste, that we have uh, for you to leverage that technology. Um, and so I wondered whether there were other ways around it, whether you were using anything outside of breakwaters to be able to do this work. The second question I have is, the, on, during your presentation, your colleague who does work around the regulations, um, navigating the regulations from state to state or country to country, um, I'm wondering whether you can share what that experience has been like, just so that we know whether these are some of the same issues that we might face in Nigeria, if this is a technology that would come here and then scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. So first of all, regarding breakwaters, uh, Nigeria does have certain breakwaters, but does not have as much breakwaters as it actually needs. Nigeria has a very big problem of coastal erosion. Your coast is being ruined by the day because of the strong activity of the wave, but I guess that because of different financial lim limitations or, uh, I don't know, governmental decisions, uh, you do need breakwaters in many places that are not existent. So we do have opportunity, for example, this is something that we're looking to do in Vietnam, which also faces a similar situation and in Bangladesh, where we're doing right now feasibility studies with a local partner. So basically we're incorporating the floaters into a structure that will be built to house the floater, but we're not just putting this uh, structure anywhere that we want, we're actually kind of putting the structure in a place that it's already needed. So we kind of provide both the solution of the breakwater combined with the floaters together for the location of implementation. So that's one possibility. A second possibility is to connect to some of natural resources, like for example, uh, there's many cliffs on the coastline and so on, so the floaters can connect to cliffs, they con can connect to any type of structure uh, out there. So we can either connect to something natural and not a breakwater, or can provide the breakwater as part of the project, as we're doing in some other countries. Uh, regarding uh, regulation, um, Basically, do you want to understand how we did the process of regulation or what was the difficulties in the regulation that we faced in other countries? So the question was around difficulties? Yeah. So basically the main difficulty that uh, I saw was the fact that just wave energy is a very new type of renewable energy and as such many of the worldwide countries uh, still did not set uh, policies for it. So many times there's no regulatory framework, licensing, path, and uh, you know, legislative framework that should be in place in order to faster promote the technology. So it's kind of in a similar situation in terms of regulation where wind and solar have been 20 or 30 years ago when it was so new and governments just started to do the regulation. And then what happens is that once once one government does it, then the neighboring country does it, and the neighboring country does it as well. It's a lot of copy-paste in the end of the day. So the more the technology becomes uh, known, the more we install in new locations, the more our regulations uh, happen much faster. Uh, our big advantage is uh, on the fact that, again, we don't construct in the offshore. Usually when you're trying to construct, no matter if it's wave energy in the offshore or wind energy projects in the offshore, it requires a lot, a lot of like different maritime licenses and like environmental studies because, and you know, make sure that it doesn't interfere with the ship movements and so on because it's right in the middle of the ocean or the sea, so it can be dangerous. In our case, because we connect 
to structures, breakwaters were located basically onshore and nearshore. From our experience, the amount of licensing that we did need was always less than uh, other competing uh, renewable energy technologies which try to operate in the offshore. So this is the advantage. The only disadvantage is the fact that not enough people, not enough government know about wave energy, know that it's already happening, and that's why they didn't just sit down and set a policy. And when there's no policy, it happens many times that the government contacts us and says, wow, we really want your project and we, we get super excited and we say, we really want to give you the project. Like, which kind of licenses? What should we do? And they say, we don't know and start making the policy as we go. So it takes longer time to set the policy than for us to build the power station. And this is something that needs to change. I'm, I'm going to actually turn the question to you, Ife, because I think in addition to um, a setting up and running the hub that you're running, you're, you're also, you've been really involved in facilitating uh, the knowledge of entrepreneurs in terms of the, re, you know, access to renewable energy policy, understanding what their rights are, what their, what their opportunities are as well. Maybe just in terms of your view, and I see where you're coming with the question as well in terms of regulation, what would you, your view be in terms of the next steps of what we could do to, uh, to address these kinds of uh, policy challenges that INA has uh, brought up right now? The truth is Nigeria already has a lot of renewable energy policies um, and that can enable the sector. We haven't tested them enough. We haven't tested the policies and the regulation enough. I'll give you an instance. We have a mini grid policy that was passed in 20, was it 2017? Um, and yet we have, I think at an average of about 40 mini grid companies, 40, 45 mini grid companies operating. And we're trying to get people to build uh, up to 10,000 sites, but we're just averaging, I, th I think, less than 200 at the moment, 200, 300. So you can see that we're not being able to take advantage of what the regulation has in place to help people to scale. When it comes to the, the wave technology, um, we do have r regulations and policies that enable wind, solar, biomass, biogas, they all exist. Um, the question is, are there things beyond the regulations as they exist that are acting as barriers for people who want to come in and do this business um, to take advantage of those things? Yes, they exist. So it's not just the policy and regulatory question, it's actually how to navigate them to make it easier for people to access. One of the easiest ways to make people get access to these things is actually to digitize an application process, right? Whenever you want to operate or build, I mean, just digitize it so that it limits the human contact, you get all your paperwork in, right? And it's approved or it's not approved. I mean, if it's not approved, people know why and then, you know, but that's not what, where we are yet. And so that's, those are the barriers and those are the roadblocks that we have to attracting this sort of innovation and also to scaling the ones that we already have on the ground. And I'm not sure if that answers your question, but, you know, I don't know, Sela, did you want to answer that? Um, I think in addition to that, in addition to, to policy, um, things that we've, noticed local companies, um, they, problems that they, they have access to, to capital. Um, logistics with getting their components in because there's a lot of importation and perhaps you know, if we drive innovation more then we'll be able to um, domesticate a lot, of our, a lot of the value chain. Um, these are some of the problems that the local businesses and indeed market entry businesses face. There are one or two businesses that um, we have seen. There's one in particular that's pioneering hybrid mini-grid systems in India, and they churn out about uh, four or five mini-grids a month. Um, so in a, in a imagine how much they'll be ramping up. All on is currently helping them with their market entry um, um, setup in Nigeria, and they're already with local companies in terms of sharing technologies, but there are still a lot of hurdles and barriers. Um, if he's right, the regulation is there, but it's just one piece of the puzzle that companies need holistically to be able to, to move forward. Thank you, and it's, I think, a good point around the uh, electronic um, administrative systems. Hopefully this is something that the, the Make Lab and the IFA <laughs> people can take up as well. Um, 
Yeah, and, I, and it's also an interesting point, as you say, um, Sade, because I actually just had this discussion the other day with someone else around, you can, you know, I think Nigeria is a place where there is a million laws, like if you can dream it, there's a law for it, but it's about that implementation and about being creative uh, around how you implement, you meet the objectives through some other kinds of cooperation uh, as, as well. Um, I think I'm going to touch on one other kind of more technical point I think that was raised in, 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 this, in this presentation, and this is sort of more, uh, I guess, an ongoing theme that was in some other panels as well, is around this, do you um, import or bring in a technology, or do you uh, uh, support this, this uh, ground up, like organic approach? And what, what are your, I mean, both as, as hub managers, what is your kind of views about um, what works and doesn't work in, between these kind of two different models? And what would you suggest to somebody who's, who's looking, at bringing, trying to bring in a new technology and trying to look for partners uh, and, and working to coordinate as well? Interruption before he answers. I know Ina has to go, right? So thank you, Ina. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Great, great pleasure. Bye-bye. Um, so I think there's room for both in terms of importing some of that technology, but definitely ensuring that we grow that um, technology base and expertise. It's, um, it's kind of like, to an extent, grant funding. To an extent, you need grant funding, but a, a viable, it's not, it, it doesn't sustain a business, right? You, need, you then need to be able to, are we changing mics? You, you need to be able to transition from external grant funding to operational funding that drives the business organically. In a setup like Nigeria where we are, you know, we know that we are way behind in terms of innovation, um, I think there is a symbiotic relationship where we import um, some of these technologies, um, support businesses coming in, um, they drive their business, but at the same time, there's transference of knowledge. And along with those businesses, we have everything, we have the right structures, the framework to also begin to support, like over here, our entrepreneurs, innovators, inventors, so that they are able to become the, um, the experts, the think tanks, because they're, they're the future. Um, no one is going to love your home more than, more than you. And the only reason, well, one of the reasons that um, a lot of developed countries, I think this has been a recurring theme in, in a lot of the panels, one of the uh, reasons developed countries are thriving is because they, you know, innovation is at the heart of what they do. We need to make sure that we don't lose sight of that while still partnering with, um, with external parties. And if I could just add very briefly to that, because I agree completely with Saleh. I think there are two things. There's the part that Saleh has said about us looking at growing organically, the talent that we have here and the innovation that we have here, and also understanding that we have to have um, foreign innovators who are f far more advanced come in and do work or help the economy grow. But I want to lean on the latter because there is a great opportunity for people who are far advanced to partner with people who are starting up here. And maybe this is a challenge to the Israelis. Everybody knows you guys as you know, the leader in technology and innovation. Um, but we don't see a lot of Israeli innovation in Nigeria. The kind of companies that we're partnering with are usually European, Americans, um, Chinese, you know, even South Africans. Um, so maybe this is now a challenge for the Israelis to say, well, there is an opportunity. We see all this local talent here. We want to come. You, you know, there's a lot of um, um, mini hydros that are being built in Nigeria. With this sort of technology, we can scale it up, right? There's an, there's an immediate opportunity there. So why can't we get her to come and work with people who are through, a, maybe even through a franchise model, right, for a number of years and see that we have more mini hydros that are you know, uh, taking over the country in terms of generating energy. Maybe that's a model, and maybe that's where we need to go. So it, it could be a partnership in terms of, okay, you're already doing this, we want to get it to, uh, you know, scale, 
here's how we can partner in some sort of sustainable way. So it's not just the silence, um, it's not just sourcing talents, it's also actually just that transfer of knowledge and building partnership that serves both the person who has the innovation and the people who actually are doing the work on the ground. And I, I have to say another shout out to iFair because I think this is of course a, a testament to that. It's the foundation of this and, and really just walking around and seeing what's happening. It's, you, you already see those ideas and those partnerships uh, forming so it's good to see the both the best of both worlds coming coming together. Um, okay, I have one question standing between uh, us and lunch, so I'll make it really brief, but I, I, I felt it was really important because it was something that Ina meant, has mentioned or, or raised in all of her presentation, and that's, and that's the kind of story of her drive from, from day one, like I'm, I'm, I'm on earth to do, a, I have a purpose, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to persevere, and I found that like a really, um, important message because because I think especially in the field of entrepreneurship and I wouldn't want to un underestimate en enough I think working in the renewable energy space in Nigeria even you're talking about these these targets the like struggle in trying to meet these kind of investment targets as well is like it's it's challenging so I wanted to hear from both of you like what do you what do you do when you just feel you can't go on anymore, what is your advice uh, to, to others to, to just keep going and, and, uh, and, and move on and, and, and find success? You wanna go first? <laughs> um, okay, that's an interesting question. Her, her story was quite fascinating. I don't have a story that dramatic, um, but you know, I used to work for the Nigerian government and at the time that I was working, I was supporting the Minister of Power I was one of his senior aides. This was when Chibok happened. Everybody remembers the Chibok story, when girls were kidnapped. Um, I was part of a delegation that had to go meet some of the girls that had escaped in 2014, who managed to escape um, and got to safety. And there was an official delegation sent to go meet them and reassure them that they had government support. And so sitting down there and listening to these girls tell their story of what happened that night was a shift for me. It was one of the most dramatic and fundamental things that have happened in my life. And I remember driving back to the airport in Medugri to catch a flight back to Abuja and asking my boss then to say, what are we going to do? You know, what's going to happen to communities like Chibok? My boss looked at me and said to me, well, that's going to be for your generation to answer, not mine. So it was like passing the buck, and it was me. At that time, I had just become a mother for the first time. So, you know, you're meeting girls who went to school to get an education and had just been kidnapped. I was obviously hormonal because I was a new mom, you know, and trying to figure out, wow, you know, this is what we're having to deal with. Um, and so for me, that was actually a, 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 an aha moment for me to say, well, we have to be able to get electricity into towns like Chibok. Um, and then started, because I used to do everything on grid, before that, I was focused on the grid, not off-grid. But after that whole Chibok experience and me having to then travel across the country as we're closing down our projects, I, I decided to focus on off-grid. So that's my story. Like I said, it's not as dramatic because I wasn't personally kidnapped, but it was me meeting people who had gone through something traumatic and saying, well, how can we then use the work that we do um, to, to help solve bigger problems. And that's a wicked problem because when you travel to all these off-grid communities and you see the level of poverty and lack, and you see just how much building a, a mini-grid can fundamentally change those communities, you understand the importance of what you do and that's what keeps you going. I am... Um so I'll, I'll, I'll take that um, in two parts, one more from a corporate, what we at All On see with our investee companies, those that struggle and those that, um, those that, those that succeed. I think, you know, Design Thinking 101 tells us that there's three parts. First, you need to um, know your market, the people, what are their pain points really, and is there a demand for your, for your solution? Then you'll refine your solution. Two, technically, is your, is your idea um, feasible? And then as a business commercially, is it viable? And I think a lot of companies gravitate towards the last two and don't really focus 
as much as they should, and this is where innovation comes in, don't focus enough on the solution design uh, to a specific problem. If I were to single out one particular company that stood out in our portfolio, um, run, by, run by a lady, and it's great to see so many lady innovators and entrepreneurs here. Um, honestly, I think you guys are, you know, businesses succeed more when we have women at, at, at the front and center. And I'm not just saying that. So well done. So this lady, her company, they, they um, deploy solar home systems and they, they won um, our USADF All On Challenge. It's a challenge that we run every year where we give $100,000 for a project to, 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 to be deployed. Usually it takes about 12 months from when funds are deployed. She received funds at the end of last year, you know, pretty much in the middle of the pandemic. And by June this year, she had exceeded her targets, even more so than companies um, from the prior cohort. Now, what was her secret? She was trying to sell, they were trying to sell their product and they realized that they were struggling. So perhaps there wasn't a fit with what the market wanted. This was a solution for market traders primarily. So they spent days, weeks, and months in the heart of the market discussing with the market traders, you know, what would you like? What does energy mean for you? How would it change your business? What will it take for you to be able to afford your, um, to afford the energy? And this, you know, sitting down with them and learning and observing helped them refine not just their product, but their business model, their revenue model, making it flexible for, for the traders. And over time, obviously with her persistence, you know, her, her market base saw that, you know, she was the real deal. And, and that's pretty much how her business accelerated to the point that Olon's now made a subsequent investment. So grit and graft is something that keeps you going. Um, second point, finally, on a personal note, um, I, used to, I, I used to live in the UK for most of my life and I moved back to Nigeria seven years ago. Um, at the time, you know, my, my, my family, my wife and I thought, you know, we want to raise our kids and um, Nigeria's home. It'll be nice for them to know home when, when they're a young age. And I felt at that point in my career that it was where I could give back the most. And it hasn't been the easiest. Nigeria is not the easiest place, right? Um, but it hasn't been the easiest, right? But um, in, in the last five years, I've worked with um, startup companies in various roles, finance, business development, um, but having worked in the energy space in the last two years, I'm convinced that energy, access to energy, solves a multitude of problems in so many other sectors. Healthcare, education, you name it, agriculture. It improves lives, it improves livelihoods. And so every day, almost every day, when I wake up, I have to remind myself, if all of us who could left the country, then who would be left here to look after it, to help it along? And that's what gets me going every day. Thank you. Um, so I think that's on that note of, a, I think really it's a message of a higher calling. Uh, I really hope that everyone participating today can hold on to that to, to realize their dreams. I think our higher calling right now is for lunch. Um, but <laughs> thank you everyone. It's been an incredible morning.